me, let me start by thanking the organizers for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to give a talk here about one of our latest pieces of research. So what I would like to talk about today are quantum fluctuation relations, uh, but not in the case where you start from a thermal state of the system, but rather it's off again. Uh, my mic seems on. Can you hear me now? No? No? Right. Um, one, two, one, two. Is it okay? So should I start again? Can you hear me now? No? no? Higher. Sorry? Is it better now? No? Nobody can hear me, it seems. <laughs> Very sorry about that. One, two, three. One, two, three. No? If I speak a bit loud, more loudly, is it better then? Okay, I tried to speak up. But, so let me start again by thanking the organizers for inviting me um, to come here and give a talk about one of our latest research topics on quantum fluctuation relations. And I would like to actually use these quantum fluctuation relations not to relate to, as usually, kind of thermalized states, but to uh, different kinds of states, which might be pre-thermalized states or more like uh, generalized uh, Gibbs ensembles. And I'd like to look at how can we do non-equilibrium dynamics to find out a bit more about those types of states. Now, the reason why this is a topic uh, for us of interest is that in cold atom physics, as well as in condensed matter physics, we more and more have experiments that actually take systems far out of equilibrium and try to induce, by dynamically induce, useful properties into these types of systems. And I've shown here two different kinds of uh, non-equilibrium dynamics that are particularly promising and interesting for that purpose. In the left-hand column, I got on the top an optical lattice experiment where basically a mirror is shaking, and through this shaking of the mirror, um, one tries to uh, reduce the, the hopping rates and induce a kind of mott insulating state from a superconducting state by shaking the lattice. So this is um, what you'd get here through a shaking mirror. You would induce uh, a mott insulator from a superfluid. And similarly, in um, condensed matter systems, and here I show some alkali doped fullerides. An experiment has recently been carried out where through shaking these buckyballs, so basically by driving the buckyball oscillations, one could induce a superconducting state into the system, so turn it from a conductor, from a normal conductor into a superconductor at very high temperatures just through driving. Both of those types of experiments have one thing in common. They take the system far out of equilibrium, and they induce some kind of interesting properties that make a macroscopic difference to those types of systems out of thermal equilibrium. And the second type of experiment is shown here, again, a kind of core atom implementation, and here a condensed matter implementation, where rather than driving a system periodically with some kind of laser excitations, what we can also do is do a sudden quench of the system. So in this upper example here, that's an experiment from 2012 in Emmanuel Bloch's group, what they did was suddenly quench an optical lattice to see a density wave melt, and this melting dynamics was then followed, as shown here, and we could in real time see how a density wave melts in an optical lattice. Similarly here, in a thin uh, NDI, NIO3 um, um, film, what was done was a fast laser pulse that would basically excite here the interface between um, these two types of materials to induce the melting of antiferromagnetic order. And again, both of those experiments have one thing in common. There was a sudden quench of the system, and this sudden quench led to, in one case, the melting of a, um, the, the melting of a density wave or the melting of antiferromagnetic order. And so what I would like to do today with not exactly those examples, but with some simpler examples, is I would like to discuss how one could use uh, these types of non-equilibrium states uh, and characterize them through quantum fluctuation relations, and whether it's maybe possible to use these types of fluctuation relations 
to detect uh, symmetry broken states. So some kind of conserved quantities that might take on a non-zero value in these systems when they're driven out of equilibrium, uh, whether they, those can be detected through these types of uh, fluctuation relations. Now, fluctuation relations are, of course, a very kind of intriguing concept in that they take thermodynamics a step further and um, make some equ equ equalities out of what we usually know from thermodynamics as inequalities. So in particular, what we have in thermodynamics is that if we do, a, do work on a system, then the only thing we know is that this amount of work that we need to do needs to be bigger or equal to the uh, change in the, free en in the free energy of the system, and that uh, the entropy needs to always increase as we do such kind of crunches or uh, work on the system. And that, of course, those relations are fundamental to the operation of all kind of uh, heat engines, fridges, and so on and so forth. But what remains is that we always have to deal with inequalities and then optimize those. Um, what we don't have in traditional uh, uh, thermodynamics, and what was only discovered in the early 90s, are that we can turn these types of relations into equalities. And if instead of just looking at the work, we look at the expectation value of this e to the minus beta times the work, so where beta is the temperature of the system, and we average this over many runs, then what we get is an equation here that equates this expectation value to the change in the free energy. And this is termed the Yashinsky equality and turns basically something that up here is an inequality into, uh, into an equality if we average over many runs. And similarly, one has the so-called Crookes relation, which relates the amount of work that is needed uh, in a forward process, so we drive the system out of one state into the other to the work that is needed to drive the system back from the final state to the initial state in this so-called Crookes relation. And those types of equalities were first uh, invented and derived for classical systems, and for instance, were used here in this um, beautiful paper in 2005 to do some sequencing of DNA. So basically what people did there was they measured the force it takes to tear a DNA apart, a DNA apart and from the fluctuations in the forces that are needed to do so, they could, um, via these uh, Crookes relations, find out what the sequence of the different pairs in this DNA would be. Now, if one takes these types of uh, equalities to the quantum regime, one can do so by basically considering the dynamics of a system that is described by a certain Hamiltonian, is coupled to a bath at temperature beta, and then is taken out of this thermal equilibrium by some kind of process that here, for simplicity, I assume, is a process that is unitary. And if we take such a unitary process and work out how much work is needed to take the system out of this thermal equilibrium to some other state, then again what we find is that this expected uh, amount of work here in the exponent is equal to the change in the free energy in the, in the system. So exactly the same thing as we had for the classical case. And similarly, for these systems also the so-called Dasaki-Crookes relation holds that again relates the work needed to take a system out of equilibrium in a forward process to the system in the backward process, and those two things are again related in exactly the same way as before for the classical system. However, all of those types of um, processes assume that we start from a thermal state. So the assumption is that the system is fully thermalized and we have here only one parameter, the parameter beta, the temperature, or the inverse temperature of the system that characterizes this type of system. And what I would like to look at now is, oh, sorry, and um, also this kind of quantum uh, Yasinski equality has been tested experimentally in an experiment in 2015 in a single ion trap experiment. And one can see here that the agreement between the kind of uh, theoretical predictions here in the, these color bars and the actual measurements agreed extremely well. So both the classical and the quantum version of these equalities have been tested and used in experiments. Now, what I would like to do today is actually to look at what happens if instead of having a thermal state, we start out with a state that is characterized by some Hamiltonian again, but in addition, a set of uh, observables that commute with this Hamiltonian and are conserved initially. So basically, that means that our initial state is now not described just by a quantity beta, 
but also by a set of more Lagrange multipliers, beta k, that uh, are kind of constraining the average values of these observables mk. And so rather than having a pure thermal state, what we now look at is a state that has the typical e to the minus beta h term here, but then a set of more uh, con uh, Lagrange multipliers constraining these mk's. And so basically this so-called generalized Gibbs ensemble here is a state that will actually be the one with the most entropy under the constraints that we have a fixed average energy and we have a fixed average of those types of uh, quantities mk. And what I would like to look at now is how do um, fluctuation relations relate the work that is done on this system to these types of uh, generalized Gibbs ensembles, and can this be used to detect, say, if such a conserved quantity exists and uh, what, what its value might be. Now, in order to do this, what one needs to do is extend the kind of uh, meaning of work a little bit. So rather than just having the, the work um, defined as the difference between the initial energy and the final energy, we need to add to this all of these kind of initial values for the uh, observable mk and for the observable ml with the corresponding um, Lagrange multipliers here. And so what we need to do is we need to define, to, to replace the work that we initially had without these conserved quantities by the difference in this final value of this pro property A and the initial value of this property A. And if we do so, then indeed what we get is a generalized Jasinski equality. This generalized Jasinski equality will now relate this e to the minus w, so this generalized work that I just introduced, to the difference in the generalized Gibbs ensemble free energy. And we'll also get generalized dasaki crookes relations, which relate the forward process to a backward process, again, in the same way as before, but now relating this, uh, these generalized works to the change in the free energy, where this change in the free energy is, or the free energy is now defined as the logarithm of this uh, partition function of the uh, generalized Gibbs ensemble state. And so basically what we now have is a set of equations that relates a kind of work type quantity in any out of equilibrium process to properties of the generalized Gibbs ensemble in this system. And we'd like to look at what the meaning is of this in some simple examples that I would like to discuss now. And the first example is, I just, sorry, just take the Dicke model so the Dicke model basically couples a bosonic field to an ensemble of spin one-half systems. So what we have here is a Hamiltonian where we have the bosonic field. So this is typically a cavity field described by field operators A and A dagger and some uh, energy omega A. Um, then here we've got the energy of the spin ensemble. So the JZ basically is just the Z component of this kind of uh, sum over all the spins. And those two systems interact with each other. And the way they interact with each other is that they can basically exchange quanta between each other with a, with a coupling G times here's a parameter 1 minus alpha, where we basically create an excitation in the spin by destroying an excitation in the field, or the other way around. And if we have a non-zero alpha here, then also the opposite process can happen. And this is the two um, excitations are created one in the field and one in the spin ensemble, or two can be destroyed at the same time. Now, this type of Hamiltonian can be realized in ion traps. So basically, if you have here an ion trap, these ions would um, constitute the spin ensemble. And if we take two lasers, one red detuned, one blue detuned, then this type of model can be realized. And by changing the properties of this laser driving, we can change these parameters g and alpha here. And now the interesting thing about this model is that if we choose alpha to be equal to zero, then we have a conserved quantity here. So the number, total number of excitations in the spins and in the field is a conserved quantity and will not change as long as alpha is equal to zero. And so what we now assume is that we start from such a state with alpha equals zero, then we turn alpha on for a while to some non-zero value and turn it back off again. And at the same time, we increase this uh, strength g to uh, such a value that we would expect this uh, m, the number of uh, total excitations, to change with time. 
And if we now look at what that type of um, evolution would, how that type of evolution would look like in the standard um, dosaki crookes relation, what we find is that actually there's a big difference in the work distributions between the forward process and the backward process. So here in blue is the probability distribution of the work needed to effect this type of change, this type of uh, evolution here in the forward direction. And in white is how this work uh, distribution would look like in the backward direction. And so what we can see here is that these two uh, probability distributions do not agree. And because they don't agree, we can actually conclude from this that some kind of conserved quantity uh, we have missed out. So there's something that um, tells us this system is not yet thermalized. And in particular, this system was not really in a, in a thermal state initially with no conserved charges. If, however, we instead take the uh, generalized dasaki crookes relation and relate the forward direction with this generalized work to the backward direction, what we find here is perfect agreement between those two uh, probability distributions. So basically by identifying this uh, quantity M, this conserved quantity, as um, something that takes the initial system out of thermal equilibrium, we can again use this dasaki crookes relation in a generalized way to relate uh, work in a non-equilibrium dynamics to properties of a generalized uh, Gibbs ensemble here. Okay, similarly, if we want to take the Yasinski equality, we get a similarly interesting behavior. The first thing that you notice is that this um, expected, ex sorry, this exponent of the standard Gibbs-free um, energy and the generalized Gibbs-free energy, they do not agree. So basically, if you were to now measure the work to identify what is the change in free energy, one would get a wrong result, because one would always get the change in the generalized Gibbs ensemble free energy and not in the Gibbs ensemble free energy here. So those two differ, and thus um, one would get a wrong result if one were just to, you, to assume that there is no conserved quantity here. If one then now measures the work for, again, a similar process as I've shown before, so we we start off with alpha equals zero, that is M is a conserved quantity, turn this into something non-zero, and then back into something zero, and similarly increase this coupling G here. Then what we find is that for very short times, so if we turn this uh, change here, these quenches on, for just a very short amount of time, both types of Yasinski equality disagree with one another. So here we have got the um, the triangles, the blue triangles, are the standard Yasinski equality, and they give exactly the same result as this um, generalized um, Yasinski equality. So both of those terms agree. And the reason for this is that if this quench is done very, very short and quickly, then there's not enough time uh, for this uh, conserved quantity to dissolve itself and to turn into some, and, and to basically become thermalized. So that means there's hardly any change in this value of M, and all these um, different types of works give us the same um, value for the free energy change. However, if we make this time longer, then we see some marked difference between the two types of um, work functions. And in particular, we see here that the generalized work remains exactly where it should be. It's constant, it is independent, of the uh, duration of this protocol, so how long it takes to turn this on and off, and the two agree as they should. However, the kind of standard work will actually deviate massively from what we've had before. And the reason for this is that after about this kind of length of the protocol, the kind of conserved quantity starts to get messed up, it starts to thermalize, and this leads to a change in, our, uh, in the work that is needed to drive the system out of equilibrium. So basically, in this case, the Yasinski equality can be used to kind of track the dynamics of uh, non-equilibrium quantities and conserved quantities in the starting state over time. And here, we, for instance, get that the lifetime of these types of uh, M, this, the lifetime of this M in a, in a quench would be about 0.1 uh, microseconds for these particular values that we've chosen. If the protocol takes longer, they will just scramble and thermalize. 
Okay, now a second example is now not one where we do a quench, but I would like to do a second example where we look at what happens if we drive the system and whether again we can use these types of ideas to characterize driven states of quantum systems. Now in order to uh, kind of do this in a concrete example, I'd like to take the, the Hubbard Hamiltonian and the Hubbard Hamiltonian that is driven in the limit where the interaction energy U is much larger than the uh, kinetic uh, energy T. So the hopping between different sides is small and we have a the system is dominated by the interaction energy. And in this particular case, what we can do is can get rid of double occupancies in this system, and what we are left with is basically a Hamiltonian that is mostly described by this hopping between or fermions between different sites, and so we have uh, fermions moving along um, a lattice. If they sit on top of each other, a large energy that uh, repels the two. Okay, and now we turn on some driving, and this driving that we would like to turn on it's a driving that basically shakes the individual lattice sites up and down. So we basically want the system to wobble around in time. And then we look at what happens to this system if we do this. So if we drive this system and um, make the driving amplitude stronger and stronger, how does this system change in time? Effectively, we model this by just having an on-site energy that oscillates in time. So we add to the Hamiltonian uh, sinusoidal uh, modulation here of the on-site energies, and we do this in an alternating way so that if one goes up, the other one goes down, because if they all oscillate in phase, nothing much happens. Now, in this particular uh, situation, what we find is, and this is well known from a, a number of experiments, is that as we increase the amplitude of the driving, what happens is that the bandwidth, and the, hence the, the hopping uh, amplitude between different lattice sites goes down with the driving strength like a Bessel function. And so if we start out here with a, with a band um, that is brought that has a, approximately 40 width in a 1D system, then this bandwidth will get smaller and smaller. And here at this point, the driving is so strong that uh, any kind of hopping between different lattice sites is suppressed. And we basically get all the band collapse into one point. This happens if our driving uh, um, frequency is large compared to all other quantities in the system. So we have now a driving that is much faster than any kind of interaction strength, than any kind of hopping, and then basically we just suppress the, uh, the tunneling of particles between the different sites. If instead we take this driving frequency below you, then the behavior is slightly different. So what we get is we do not get really uh, com compression of the band width to one point and thus kind of stop any, any type of, of uh, dynamics. But instead what we are left with is a certain bandwidth here that is determined by four times the exchange interaction, so the T squared over U here, and that never goes away. So there's always some residual uh, dynamics going on in the system, and what we're interested in is in this limit, how does the system behave close to this point here? And in order to study this, we first did some numerics and just turn on the, uh, the driving strength in a slope, as you see here, and look at what are the properties of this system if we take a Hubbard model and do this oscillation with ever-increasing modulation strength. And then we look at different types, we looked at different types of correlations, particularly the density-density correlations, spin-spin correlations, and pair correlations. And I'd like to focus here on the pair correlations. So the pair correlations would tell us how um, two fermions pair together and then um, move together through the system. And this is captured by this correlation function here that, we, that basically correlates a pair that is located at sites i and i plus 1 to sites j and j plus 1. And if we turn on this driving, what we find here is that indeed this system turns from one that has um, a Hubbard-like ground state into one that looks completely differently, and instead of having a peak here in the structure factor at four times kf, has, a, has two peaks at two times kf, and basically turns from a repulsive Lattinger liquid into an attractive Lattinger liquid if we just look at the slope here. So here is the slope at uh, q equals zero, and what you see is that for 
weak driving, this Luttinger parameter always stays below one, so we have a repulsive Luttinger liquid. But if we drive the system very strongly, we get an attractive Luttinger liquid, and it seems that the system moves from a metallic state into a superconducting state. We looked at that also through the spin structure factor, and again uh, conclude the same thing, because what we get is in the structure factor, uh, two peaks at 2kf turn into one peak at, at pi, and this indicates a doubling of the um, wavelength of the spin wave. So rather than having here a, sp a spin wave with uh, 2kf here, we get, it seems to indicate that we get pairs, and those pairs have a different types of um, spin wave, and we conclude that you know, this might be due to antiferromagnetically bound pairs in this system. If we then look at the pair correlations, this uh, picture is corroborated even more. So we turn on the system's uh, driving and find that the pair uh, correlation peak increases massively at Q equals zero and seems to indicate that, again, pairs are formed and these pairs in the system would then bind together and move together through the system. Now that is what we find from the numerics, but now I would like to use this type of uh, fluctuation relations to find out whether one can say a bit more about those uh, types of pairs. And in order to do this, what we do, what we do is we write down a low energy TJ model. So basically, we now assume that this driving can be effectively described as adiabatic motion or as, as dynamics in a low, low uh, energy DJ model, where we have um, as the first term, the hopping again, where single particles hop from one lattice side to the next with a hopping amplitude that is suppressed uh, by the driving according to this zeroth order Bessel function. The other terms, it turns out, are totally unaffected by this driving. So if we now have here a bare, um, a bare uh, energy here, so where basically a pair binds together, and that gives it a reduced um, energy J, then that uh, singular bare binding is unaffected by the driving and remains the same as what it was without driving. Similarly, we here have terms where the bears hop from one side to the other, and that hopping goes like alpha times j, with alpha is one half. And again, this type of hopping of pairs is unaffected by the driving. So it turns, and, and finally what we do, is we project out any double occupancies because they are still high up in energy. So it turns out that in this low energy model, the only thing that really depends on our driving strength is the hopping of individual pairs. And if we now um, basically change the driving strength, all that will happen is that this hopping term here changes. And in particular, if we uh, go to resonance where the hopping term is zero, what we'll have is that the number of nearest neighbor pairs that are described here by those two terms in the Hamiltonian will be a conserved quantity. And what we're now going to look at is what happens if we start from the situation where the system is described by this low interaction, uh, by, sorry, by this low energy um, Hamiltonian, in the case that driving is such that the hopping term is switched off, this number of uh, nearest neighbor pairs should be a conserved quantity. And if this number of nearest neighbor pairs is zero, so this means if our driving has not induced any nearest neighbor pairs, then the evolution of our system should be perfectly uh, aligned with the standard Dasaki Crookes and Yashinsky equations. If our driving has actually induced a non zero number of pairs, then our evolution should violate the Yasinski equality and instead uh, agree with the uh, generalized Yasinski equality. And so what we did in order to study this is we looked at um, an initial state that is just like a, a GG state that I introduced before. So we here have a temperature, Hamiltonian, with zero hopping and then some kind of uh, chemical potential here for the pairs that fixes our average number of pairs. We start at dynamics at t tilde equals zero, so no single particle hopping, and turn this towards one. And then we look at the standard work. So basically, if we do the standard work, what we should get here is that the expected amount of work that is needed to drive the system from this, from, from this value of zero to 0 0.1 is just zero on average. 
and the fluctuations are shown here, so the W squared is, is shown here. So this means that our standard Yasinski equality will predict zero work is needed to do this. If instead, of course, we take the generalized work, then what we, what we find is a very different behavior. So the generalized work goes like the um, number of pairs in the system, and hence, by just measuring this uh, generalized work in this quench of t from zero to some finite value, we will see a change in the amount of generalized work that is needed. And now, of course, this uh, a measurement of the work needed to drive the system from t equals zero to t equals 0 0.1 could therefore be used to test whether or not we have produced some uh, pairs in, in our driving process. And similarly, of course, we can then work out all sorts of higher moments of the generalized work and of the magnetization and constrain the uh, probability distribution of our um, pairs produced in the driving uh, by measuring generalized work of that system. Now, I should add that all of these results are still preliminary. We haven't really published any of this yet, but um, what we can see here is actually, if I go back, is a very good agreement between the generalized work and the, and the number of pairs that we've produced here between the two cases. So it seems that this is actually already working very well. Now, with this, I would like to come to my summary. Um, what I hope I've, I've shown today is that um, it should be possible to use extended quantum fluctuation relations to uh, track the formation and destruction of charges in quantum quenches. So if one has some conserved quantities that have produced some non-zero value for conserved quantities, then one might be able to, to track their evolution and their lifetime and their dis destru destruction and creation through measuring the work that is needed uh, to drive the system out of this kind of pre-thermalized state. One can hopefully use this also to detect pre-thermalized states, because if there is a pre-thermalized state, then the standard Dershinsky and the Saki crookes relations will not hold anymore. And that means it should be possible to identify them through measuring work in the needed to drive the system, and also to identify conserved degrees of freedom that one might not know about. So if one measures, actually, in good faith and assumes that the system is thermalized, and then finds that there is a discrepancy between the uh, Yasinski equality and the Saki Crookes relation and the, and the experimental results, then one can try to start thinking about maybe there are some conserved quantities that one needs to include into the consideration to make this work, and so hopefully be able to identify some of them. And then, of course, you know, by, measure, by doing the same thing, it should also then be um, possible to indirectly at least observe dynamically induced symmetry breaking, like I showed in the last part of the, the talk, in the last example, if we basically take this system and create pairs, and they start to form a, a condensate of pairs, then again, this should constrain the system even further and um, violate uh, even these generalized Yashinsky qualities that I've shown, but we haven't really shown that yet. Here are some references, and I'd like to conclude by thanking uh, the people who have been working on this, in particular, Jody Moore-Petit, who has been uh, the leading senior postdoc on this, Jonathan Coulthard, who has been doing all the uh, calculations, all the numerical calculations, and our collaborators, Armando Relano and Rafael Molina in Spain. And of course, I'd also like to thank all the other members of my group, postdocs and PhD students, and of course, most importantly, all our people who give us the money to do what we do every day. All right, and with this, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.